Hello anatomy students. Today we're going to talk about the functions of muscle tissue and the structure of skeletal muscle tissue. So we're going to start this by first talking about the functions of muscle tissue in general and then we're going to focus on the structure of skeletal muscle tissue. We'll talk about cardiac muscle when we talk about the heart in our cardiovascular unit and we're going to talk mostly about smooth muscle when we talk about the digestive system and the excretory system. So here are our objectives. Number one, provide examples of the locations and functions of the three muscle types. Explain the functions and properties of muscle tissue. Describe the location and function of connective tissue that's associated with muscle tissue. Explain how the skeletal, nervous, and cardiovascular systems cooperate to allow the muscular system to perform its functions. And finally, you should be able to describe the microscopic structure of muscle tissue. All right, let's just dig in here. So first of all, we've got three different kinds of muscle, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle. And I think that the very first thing that should catch your eye when you look at these pictures is that skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle look very similar to one another. This is because they appear to be striped or striated, which um, is due to the fact that these two muscle types have contractile proteins in their cells that are lined up in a very specific pattern. And when they line up, it appears striped. So you've got light band, dark band, light band, dark band, all the way down the length of the cell. The other thing that skeletal and cardiac muscles have, muscle cells have in common is that they are multinucleate, which means that they've got many nuclei per cell. This is because during development, this, the precursors to these cells merge together, they combine, and those nuclei stay there inside of the cell. So those two kinds of cells are going to have many nuclei. That's different from our smooth muscles. Smooth muscle cells have only one nucleus. Um, skeletal muscle is the only type of muscle that is voluntary so that's going to be under our control like we can control like when we want to do something like this <laughs> and that means that we're going to have our nervous system stimulating our skeletal muscle in order to move in that way our smooth muscle and our cardiac muscle however is involuntary um, our cardiac muscle is going to have a specific structure called an intercalated disc that is not going to be found in any of the other types of muscle, and that is this little line that we have right here. The intercalated discs are going to physically join our cardiac muscle cells together so that they can communicate very swiftly and very efficiently. And that's going to allow our heart, even though it's made up of a lot of different cells, it's going to, to act as, as a single unit. And the reason why is because of these intercalated discs. Our smooth muscle cells um, are going to have the same kinds of proteins that make the stripes, that make the striations in the skeletal muscle and in the cardiac muscle, except their cytoplasm appears smooth because these proteins are not arranged in a pattern. Instead, they're kind of jumbled in there all randomly, and that's going to make the cytoplasm of these cells appear smooth underneath the microscope. Uh, I just wanted to also say that um, skeletal muscle cells are long and straight, cardiac muscle cells are highly branched, and smooth muscle cells have a spindle shape. And I'm sure you're like, well, what's a spindle shape? Well, it kind of looks like this, where you have tapered ends, like where the ends are kind of squished together, like somebody pinched them together, and then like here's the little nucleus there. So that's what a spindle-shaped cell is going to look like. All right, our muscles, so this is again like all kinds of muscles, are going to produce body movements. So that's not just skeletal muscle, right? Like our skeletal muscle is going to move our skeleton. That's why it's called skeletal muscle. Um, but our cardiac muscle is going to produce movements that are going to propel blood 
through our vascular system and out to the rest of the body. And our smooth muscle is also going to propel, like if you think about the digestive system, like food through the stomach and food through the small intestine to the large intestine and then eventually out of the body. So these are all still body movements. Our muscles are going to stabilize body position. Um, this is largely going to be due uh, to our skeletal muscle action, like even the way that you're sitting in your chair or laying on your bed right now, you have skeletal muscles that are contracting in order to allow you to maintain that position um, all the time. So you've always got some kind of muscle contraction going on in your body. Uh, storing and moving substances within the body. I kind of went over that already with the smooth muscle. Um, that's going to push uh, food through our uh, body systems. And then also with every muscle contraction, you get a product of energy, which is in the form of heat. And that is something called thermogenesis. The heat that is created through muscle contractions is going to help maintain our body's constant internal temperature. So in this way, our muscles are actually helping our body maintain homeostasis. All right, our muscles are going to exhibit electrical excitability. This basically means that just like neurons, muscle cells are going to, um, are going to propagate action potentials through them. Um, so for instance, what we're looking at on our picture here is we have a motor neuron that is innervating or making a synapse with a skeletal muscle. And when the motor neuron releases its neurotransmitter in the synapse that exists between the um, axon terminal and the skeletal muscle, that neurotransmitter binds to the skeletal muscle and that's gonna cause an action potential to occur if it reaches threshold to cause an action potential to occur down the muscle cell and then eventually cause contraction. So uh, our muscle cells are going to require a chemical stimulus in order for those contractions to occur. You've also got this word here, an autorhythmic electrical sin signal. So auto lends itself to believe that this signal is being generated on its own. And that's what happens in the heart. There's a group of specialized cells in the heart called the pacemaker of the heart. And it is going to generate an electrical pulse that is going to set the pace for the rhythmic contractions that occur in the heart. That's why your heartbeat is so predictable. I mean, unless you know, you're exercising or you're frightened or something like that. And then of course that's going to speed up. Um, but that's what the autorhythmic electrical signal means. But all muscle cells are going to have uh, the ability to propagate an action potential through them, and it's these action potentials that are going to cause muscle contraction. Let's move on to our next bullet point then, which is contractility. So our muscles are going to be able to shorten, that's contraction or contractility, and they're also going to extend, that's extensibility. And through this cycle of contraction and extension and contraction and extension, our muscles are going to um, retain their shape. They are not going to be damaged. And the reason why is because they also have the property of elasticity. And that's what we have there. Okay, so those were all of the different properties of our muscle tissue in general, and now we're going to talk about the structure of skeletal muscle tissue. Remember that the definition of the body's muscular system is the skeletal muscle and the connective tissues that are gonna connect it to the bones. Um, so, Let's just start with the general like macroscopic view of what a muscle looks like. So if you take a look at our picture, our muscle is here. It's connected by a tendon to the bone itself. And one muscle is made up of many smaller groups of muscle cells, which are called fascicles. And muscle fibers are the same as muscle cells. And that's what I have for you here in this very first bullet point. So our muscles are also going to contain some connective tissue. 
Um, these are going to be kind of tucked in between those various fascicles that make up the whole muscle. They are going to add support and hold these muscles together, and they're going to allow um, these different uh, fascicles to move freely. So, you know, it's, it's um, it, it, the, the contraction of a muscle doesn't mean that every single fiber is going to be contracting. Sometimes um, only some of the muscle fibers are going to be contracting, and these separations with the connective tissue within the muscle itself is going to allow for that. And then these connective tissues are also going to um, support the entrance and the exit of blood vessels and nerves to and from our muscle cells. So the two main types of um, connective tissue that we're going to have are areolar tissue and adipose tissue. Recall way back when we were talking about different tissues that are found in the body, areolar tissue is going to have lots of uh, this fluid or gel-like um, extracellular matrix, and there's lots of spaces in between our um, proteins that are found uh, inside of the extracellular matrix, like the, the elastic um, fibers and the collagen fibers. And that's what you see in our top picture here. The, the, the pink and purple lines um, are the proteins. You've got cells that are suspended in there, and then you've got this matrix, um, you know, water and proteins and um, that are d dissolved in there that are going to uh, fill the spaces in between those proteins. Um, adipose tissue is a type of a realer tissue. It's just that, like you can see, like the matrix, like in pink in between, but you've got an abundance of adipose cells. Adipose cells are just cells that are filled with lipids, and there's so much lipid um, inside of the cytoplasm of the cell that these little dots, these nuclei, these are the little nuclei that are just like smashed up against the inside of the cell membrane. And so that's what is um, happening with the adipose tissue. Um, so we've got adipose tissue, and then um, again, we've got uh, fascia, which is really a combination of areolar tissue and adipose tissue there. All right, so um, we have connective con tissue components that are going to strengthen and support the muscle itself. Uh, we have a couple of different terms for you to know. So once again, here is our tendon, and remember that tendons are connective tissue. They're made of dense, regular connective tissue, so they're very tough, and tendons are going to connect the muscle to the bone. The outside of the muscle itself is covered by a connective tissue called the epimyceum, and remember that the prefix epi means on top of, and mice means, uh, refers to muscle. So epimyceum means on top of the muscle. I mentioned that each muscle is made up of multiple fascicles. A fascicle, which is just a group of um, uh, muscle fibers or muscle cells, a fascicle is surrounded by the perimyceum. And peri, just like the word perimeter, means around, so around the muscle. And then the muscle fibers that that are found within each fascicle, they are each, each one is surrounded by its own endomyceum. And endo means within the muscle. So the deepest of these connective tissue layers is the endomyceum, it's found within the muscle. The middle one is the perimyceum, and then the one that's on the outside or on top of the muscle, that's the epimyceum. So knowing those prefixes is going to help you understand what the location of these different connective tissues are. Tendons, then, are really just a continuation of the epimyceum. And the tendon, then, is even continuous with the periosteum, which is found on the outside of the bone. Now, there's another term here called an aponeurosis, which is a tendon, except it's got a different form. Tendons are cord-like. But an aponeurosis is like a flat sheet of connective tissue. You're going to see that especially in the large, broad muscles that are found in our back. And these aponeuroses are going to connect these muscles all the way down the length of our vertebral column. So that's what an aponeurosis is. 
All right, so for those of you that like ham, uh, here we have a woman who's holding a very large ham roast. And the ham is coming from the thigh of the pig, which means that the bone, the thigh bone, or the, the pig's femur, is right here, right in the middle of that ham bone. But I like this picture because you can really see what I'm talking about. So here we've got the entire thigh muscle that we have. And if you can just look closely, look at, there's a fascicle and here's a fascicle. And look, you even have some adipose tissue here in the center that's kind of filling in the spaces in between um, those fascicles and like even down down here you can see that there as well all of this pink part here the part that you're going to put on your sandwich all of that those are um those are going to be um your your muscle cells your your muscle fibers okay um so uh muscles are going to have um arteries um or capillaries that are going to bring oxygen and nutrients to our muscle fibers and then veins, which are going to take them away from, take wastes away from our muscle fibers. But we're also going to have a motor neuron. Every single muscle fiber, every single muscle cell is innervated by a motor neuron. And that's a very important point because if it's not innervated by a motor neuron, then it's not going to be able to contract. Muscle fibers must have nervous stimulation in order to contract. And again, we're talking about skeletal muscle here. So just remember that this is just one, one kind of, skeletal, of muscle that we're talking about. Okay, so um, now we're going to zoom in and look at the microscopic structure of our skeletal muscles. So once again, for review, we have our large muscle, which is made up of many fascicles. And within one fascicle, we have many muscle cells, AKA muscle fibers. Well, guess what? Each muscle cell is made up of multiple myofibrils. Well, what's a myofibril? It's really just a long strand of proteins, proteins that we call myofilaments and our myofilaments are arranged in contractile units called sarcomeres you're going to notice in this picture of our sarcomere that we have thin myofilaments which are shown in yellow and then we have thick myofilaments one of which I just circled here which are shown in like that rusty red color on our other diagram that we have here by the star that I'm just drawing, the dark bolded lines, those are representing the thick myofilament, which I circled in the sarcomere picture above. And then these thin lines are representing the thin myofilaments, which I've drawn the arrow to where that, uh, that yellow structure is drawn. Okay, so each Muscle fiber is made up of these myofilaments and proteins. But there's, there's more to it than just that. That's what's on the inside. Around the outside of every muscle fiber, now what we're looking at in this picture is a fascicle. And this fascicle has one, two, three, four, five, six muscle fibers. So we're looking at six muscle cells here. All of these little dots inside of the muscle cell, those are the myofibrils. We're gonna leave the myofibrils out of it for just a second. We're just gonna talk about these six um, uh, muscle cells here. Each muscle cell has a cell membrane. But when we're talking about muscle cells, the name changes. It's called a sarcolemma. That root, sarco, means flesh. And isn't that what you're eating whenever you have a cheeseburger, right? You're eating the meat. That's flesh. So the sarco, sarco means flesh. So the sarcolemma is the cell membrane that covers each muscle cell. And if you notice, the sarcolemma has these little blue dots here. Those represent pores or holes, kind of like the surface of a saltine cracker. It's got little holes in, in it. These holes lead into the cytoplasm called the sarcoplasm of each muscle cell. 
the holes are turning into tubes called T-tubules, also known as transverse tubules, but we just abbreviate it T-tubules. What is the purpose of these holes and of these tubules? It allows for depolarization down into the cell. So like I said before, muscle cells are able to propagate action potentials through their cell membranes, through their sarcolemmas, but those action potentials also have to go into the cells in order for muscle contraction to occur. The way that the action potential spreads into the cell is via the T-tubules. I just wanted to mention what our sarcoplasm contains, because remember, our muscles have to contract, and in order to contract, you need energy, you need ATP. So our sarcoplasm is going to be uh, crowded with mitochondria, those are the powerhouses of the cells, the organelles that are going to generate ATP. We have myoglobin, which is going to carry oxygen, because again, the most efficient way for our muscle cells to get ATP, to generate ATP, is through aerobic respiration, which requires oxygen. And then we also need a fuel, and that fuel is glycogen. Glycogen can be broken up into its monomer, which is glucose, and then glucose is what is used in order to generate that ATP in aerobic respiration. All right, back to our muscle fibers. Our muscle fibers, AKA muscle cells, are made up of many myofibrils. So now what we're looking at in this picture, this is one muscle cell, so this is one fiber, and one fiber is made up of many myofibrils. Each myofibril is surrounded by this orange web-like looking thing called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And if you notice in the picture, the sarcoplasmic reticulum kind of surrounds this blue tube. The blue tube is the T-tubule. So the entrance into the T-tubule is up here in the sarcolemma. And then the T-tubule extends down into the cell itself. And it surrounds, it follows the contours of our myofibril. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is surrounding that T-tubule. And that's a really important thing. You see, when an action potential comes into the T-tubule, it is going to stimulate the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium ions, which are stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Those calcium ions then are going to lead to contraction of the muscle fiber. So the T-tubule and the areas of our sarcoplasmic reticulum that are adjacent to it are going to make up a structure that's called a triad. And that's what I have here in this box. The areas of the sarcoplasmic reticulum that are adjacent to the T-tubule have a name called the terminal cisterns. And this is where our calcium ions are being stored. So once again, this picture is of one muscle cell. One muscle cell is made up of many myofibrils. Each myofibril has T-tubules and sarcoplasmic reticulum surrounding it. The sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium ions in an area called the terminal cisterns. And when an action potential comes down into our T-tubule, it stimulates the release of calcium ions from the terminal cisterns. The T-tubule and the terminal cisterns that are adjacent to it make up a structure called a triad. Okay, so as I said, one myofibril is made up of contractile units, which are called sarcomeres. So there's that root again, sarco means flesh. So let's take a look at this picture again. This is all 
one muscle fiber or one muscle cell. One fiber is made up of many myofibrils, and one myofibril is made up of many, um, many sarcomeres. So, sarcomeres are kind of like the, the contractile unit. It's also the organizational unit of our contractile proteins or myofilaments, actin and myosin. So these are contractile proteins. These are the proteins that are going to allow a muscle cell to contract or shorten. We have the thick myofilament, which is called myosin, and we have the thin myofilament, which is called actin. Let's take a closer look at the sarcomere. So uh, our top picture then is showing us kind of a more like zoomed out view, like a bird's eye view of our myofibril. And um, the first thing that I wanted to point out to you is that like the, the edges or the borders of a single sarcomere are here and here where you have the zigzagged blue line. And then in the middle of the sarcomere, you have a smooth, straight blue line. The zigzag line is where our actin, our thin myofilament, is attached or anchored down. And the smooth blue line is where our thick myofilament is anchored down. So we don't have our um, myofilaments, our contractile proteins, they're not just like floating around in the sarcoplasm, they are anchored in place. And so if we look at our zoomed in view of the sarcomere, which is our bottom picture here, you can see that here's our actin myofilament, and then we have our myosin, and then we have actin, and then we have myosin. It is this alter, alter, alternation of our thin and thick and thin and thick myofilaments that gives skeletal muscle its striped appearance. Okay, so all of these different areas have names, right? So once again, we're looking at a very blown up view of a myofibril. This is like one sarcomere is in the middle and then like we have like a half of a sarcomere on each side. Okay, so like I said, the zigzag lines are the borders of the sarcomere itself. The name of that zigzag line is the Z disc. So Z, zigzag, right? I like a little alliteration. The M line is in the middle. And the thick myofilament, the myosin, is attached at the M line. What's attached at the Z disc? The actin, the thin myofilament. So the thin myofilaments are attached at the Z-disc and the thick myofilaments are anchored down at the M-line. Now, the striping that we see, the striations that we see are caused by this alternation of thick, thin, thick, thin, thick, thin. So let's take a look at this. The light band here is called the I band. And you can remember that because in the word light, the second letter is I just like I band, right? So the I band is going to consist of the Z disc in the middle, and then on either side, you're going to have only actin. So actin is the thin myofilament. So yeah, wherever you've got actin only, it's gonna look a little bit lighter because it's so thin and fine. And so you've got I bands at the ends of each sarcomere. The A band is the dark band. The second letter in the word dark is A. You have a dark band wherever you have actin and myosin overlapping. And that should make sense. You've got like more proteins there, so it's going to appear darker. In the middle, of your sarcomere, you have a lighter band also because now we've only got myosin here, but this is called the H zone. 
So in the middle of the H zone, you have the M line and you have myosin only. And so those are the how the light and the dark bands are created in the sarcomere. Or in the, I'm sorry, in the uh, muscle fibers. Okay, here's a blown up version. So now we're kind of zooming in to the sarcomere so that we can see, again, what the I bands and the A bands are made of. So once again, the I band, which is the light band, is going to have your Z disc in the center. And then you've got actin, 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 all these thin myofilaments. And like, look at, you've got a lot of space in there too. So it's going to appear light. The dark band has our actin and myosin in it. And then the center, which is a little bit lighter than the dark band, is going to have only the myosin. Now let's take a closer look at our contractile proteins. So myosin is our thick myofilament. Myosin is responsible for pulling structures towards the center of the sarcomere to cause contraction. Myosin itself is kind of shaped like, uh, like a golf club or like a music note. And as you can see here, they're laid down on their sides and then like the, the bottoms of the music note or the heads of the golf club, they're going to be kind of sticking up. The heads, the myosin heads, have two sites. The first one is the actin binding site. So this is where our myosin is going to bind to the actin that is above it or below it. The second binding site that the myosin head has is the ATP binding site. This site is where a molecule of ATP is going to come in and bind to the myosin head. But that's not enough. The myosin has to cleave that ATP. And in order to do that, it needs an enzyme. The ATP binding site on the myosin head contains an enzyme called ATPase, which is what I have here. So when ATP comes in, it binds to the myosin head and the enzyme breaks it apart. And that's what's going to provide energy to allow myosin to bind to the actin. And again, we're going to go through all of those different steps in a future discussion. But for now, you should know the thick myofilament is myosin. It has a myosin head, and there are two binding sites on it. You need to know what they are, and you need to know that the ATP binding site contains an enzyme ATPase. Okay. Now let's take a look at our actin, our thin myofilament. Interestingly, our thin myofilament isn't, doesn't just consist of one protein, it consists of three different proteins. The first protein to know is the actin, and that's like the main one. The actin is a long string of two proteins that are twisted together. The monomers are shown in this picture as little yellow circles. And you can see just by looking at this picture that each little yellow circle has a black dot in it. That black dot is the myosin binding site. So remember how I said on the previous slide that our myosin has an actin binding site on the head right here? Well, here's where it's going to bind. It's going to bind to that black dot. But you're probably like, well, how is it supposed to reach the black dot when it's got tropomyosin? You can read the picture. When it's got tropomyosin covering it. Well, that's just it. That's what tropomyosin does. Tropomyosin is a regulatory protein. And yeah, it's going to cover that myosin binding site in order to regulate the amount of contraction that's actually happening inside of that muscle, um, inside of that muscle cell. The only thing that can move tropomyosin off of the myosin binding site is troponin, also pronounced as troponin. When calcium ions bind to troponin, tropamine changes shape and it pushes the tropomyosin off of the actin binding site. And then the myosin head can bind. So, oh, did I call that the actin binding site? This, I'm sorry, this is the, the myosin binding site. 
So, to read just just to summarize, the thin myofilament actually consists of three different proteins. We have actin, tropomyosin, and troponin. And uh, remember that our every monomer on our actin molecules has a myosin binding site, the place where the myosin head is going to bind to the actin molecule. And I just also want, wanted to make sure that you saw this on our little picture here. Here we have the a myos, like a myosin head is going to bind to an actin that is superior to it. And then on the other side, you have myosin heads that are um, that are binding to actin that is inferior to it. So, you know, the myosin heads can aim down or aim up or, you know, aim off to the side. I just don't want you to think that they can only like, like go upwards because they can go in all directions. Okay, let's see how much you remember from our discussion here. I'll give you um, like a five count and then I will show you the answer. Whoops, just kidding. The first answer there, everyone should get at least one right on this. Uh, which type of muscle is striated and involuntary? Cardiac muscle. Number two, list the functions of muscular tissue. So you should at least be able to name two or three. All right, so movement, uh, supporting uh, the body positions, storing and moving substances within the body, and also thermogenesis. So those are the major ones that you should remember. Number three, which property allows muscles to stretch without being damaged? Elasticity. Number four, What's the role of capillaries in muscle tissue? To bring oxygen and nutrients to our muscle fibers and to take away waste products. Very good. And last one, number five. What is the structural unit of myofilaments? Sarcomere. All right, everyone, thanks for listening, and we'll talk again in class.